In a big apartment building in the 70s, off 3rd Avenue, lived about 200 busy New Yorkers, excluding a few who were so busy they were never home. One evening, as the sun was setting on the west side, Natalie Adams relaxed in her smart one-bedroom apartment doing her fingernails. Natalie was an associate editor on a fashionable woman's magazine and was very, very aware. Her right pinky was nearly dry when the lobby buzzer beeped. Natalie fluffed up her hair, then moved gracefully to the intercom. Who's there? She purred. It's opportunity, said the voice of a sweet young girl. I don't need any, said Natalie, and she went back to buffing her nails. Down in 3E, Irwin and Marilyn Kravitz were arranging their 10-day vacation in Miami and Nassau. Irwin had just vetoed the optional extra side trip to the Everglades when they heard the buzzer. Irwin glared at Marilyn. If that's your mother, don't answer it, he said. Don't answer it yourself, said Marilyn. Irwin slapped the table, then jumped up and marched to the intercom. What do you want? He barked. It's opportunity, came the reply. With your chance of a lifetime, buzz me in. Forget it, said Irwin. You got the wrong apartment. He sank down again behind his stack of travel folders and frowned at a paper covered with numbers. And then he suggested to Marilyn that maybe they should just consider renting a locker at Brighton Beach for weekends. <laughs> Judy Fletcher, in 12B flat, was writing another surefire pop rock blues hit, but the buzzer hit a note that most definitely was out of tune. Zudi unplugged his guitar and laid it on his collection of rejection slips. Who is that down there playing an unnatural natural up here, he cried. Opportunity, sang the voice. I have a royal offer for you. Sounds cool, grinned Zudi, but I am creating up a storm at this very moment in time, so dig me again later, will you, man? Sorry, she said. I can't. I'm only allowed to buzz once. <laughs> Opportunity tried 196 other bells, but nobody, for one reason or another, would let her in. She became tired and discouraged. Her index finger even developed a blister. A new occupational hazard, she thought, as she pushed the last remaining buzzer. <laughs> There's nobody here, cracked the voice of Miss Grace Hester. If you don't fool me one bit, you dirty, filthy, pervert deviates, she shouted. Get away, get away, before I dial 911. And she rolled her portable dishwasher in front of her door. Sadly, Opportunity slumped down on a bench, her gossamer wings drooping on the tile floor. A tear trickled down her tender cheek. From under the staircase, Stanley Wallowitz, the super, had been watching her with suspicious eyes. Abruptly, he grunted and moved towards her deliberately with slow, measured steps. Pretty lady, he said, is not my business you run around in nightgown and wings, but maybe you bother too much the tenants. Better you go before trouble is made. Opportunity flooded her eyes and tried to explain who she was and that far from making trouble, she was trying to help people, if only they'd open up to her. Please, she said, I don't want to leave the building without helping someone. Perhaps you'll go back to your apartment, and then I could come to your door and... No, lady, said Stanley. I am a family man. Also, comes my wife too soon. And gruffly but gently, he led opportunity to the sidewalk. Some city, she sighed, shaking the soot from her gown of sunbeams. They don't believe anything anymore. Nobody even recognizes me. She reflected a moment about that, and then wondered if Mayor Beam would see her. It certainly was worth a try, she decided. So Opportunity folded her wings tightly to avoid getting them squashed in the subway and headed uptown to Gracie Mansion.